and eventually all of the U.S. airspace was closed. So we knew that we were going to be diverting somewhere. And, you know, but when airlines divert, it's a very common thing. But you normally coordinate that diversion with your flight dispatcher. Uh, the captain and the dispatcher agree on the city. That day it was quite different because I didn't talk to anybody with American. They were very busy grounding all of the uh, domestic airplanes, not to mention the fact that we had just lost two airplanes in the attacks. And so um, when I came in contact with Gander Control, they ordered us to land in Gander immediately. And, you know, I really had to figure out what I was going to say to my passengers because I didn't want to say too much. And certainly, I didn't know a whole lot at the time. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I told them that there had been a crisis in the United States and we were going to be landing our airplane in Gander, Newfoundland because all of the airspace was closed. And when we got on the ground, I would give them more information, even though uh, I didn't know a whole lot until we got on the ground. And then when I landed, I was number 36 out of 38 to touch down that day. We landed about 10.15 in the morning. And they, once we got the airplane parked, they came on and said, you will not be getting off until tomorrow. And so we were on the airplane 28 hours. And there's actually a song in the show that's called 28 Hours. <laughs> so when we have we have a couple hour delay, I guess we shouldn't complain about that too much. <laughs> so fast forwarding, the next time you are in Gander is 10 years later on, in 2011 for the 10th anniversary. Can you tell us a little bit about what 9-11 means to the people of Gander and why you returned 10 years later to see them? Sure. Um, I actually got a call uh, in the summer of 2011 from an Austrian film crew. And it was just out of the blue, and they asked me if I was going back to Gander for the 10th anniversary. And I said, no, I mean, I didn't know that anything was going on. And they said, well, we're actually going to film Nick and Diane, who are also two characters it represented in the show. And they said, would you consider going back? And I said, well, you know, let me check with my husband, and I did. And when I left Gander on uh, September 15th, I always wanted to take my family back because I thought it was important for them to know where I spent those five days, especially for my children, because it was always going to be a part of history. My children were eight and nine on 9-11, and so I did want to return. So I used that as an opportunity to go back. And, um, I didn't get to take my children, but I did go back with my husband. And my crew stayed at the Comfort Inn for the five days that we were there during 9-11. Uh, and because we didn't have cell phones, I never knew when American was going to call me to go to the airport. So I never ventured very far away from the Comfort Inn. And they actually had a tunnel to a restaurant called Jungle Gems. And it's where I ate every meal for five days because I didn't want to, you know, get too far away. And so I thought when my husband and I went back that we were just going to see the Comfort Inn and Jungle Gems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that anything else had been planned. What I have since learned that is that um, Gander honors 9-11 in a very beautiful way. And it's really all about the wonderful things that they did for all of us, and really all over Canada. But Gander is, I think, prominent because they don't have an infrastructure. They had a population of about 9,400 people, and we were nearly 7,000 passengers and crew who arrived in, <coughs> excuse me, a three-hour time frame. And so we literally invaded their tiny town that has two stoplights and no hotels. They only have motels and they have a total of 500 rooms, period. So uh, it was overwhelming when we showed up. And, and so on the 10th anniversary, 
we participated in one beautiful event after the next. So it wasn't just the Comfort Inn and Jungle Gems that we got to see. We were at one event after the next and it was just beautiful. They, they honor 9-11 in a very different way than we do here in the U.S. We memorialize it here, but for them it's, it's a celebration of humanity. Amazing. And two of the people you met the, um, the 10th anniversary were David and Irene. So can you tell us a little bit about how you encountered them, what you thought when they said, we're gonna make a musical about this story, and uh, if you ever envisioned being here today after that conversation? Absolutely not. Um, while we were in Gander, all of the press was there, kind of, kind of like today, and um, they all wanted a five second sound bite for the evening news. So, you know, we did a lot of interviews, but you know, they were just short clips. And then I learned that David and Irene, the writers of the show, were in town. And I was told that they were playwrights and they wanted to know if they could do an interview with me. I said, of course. And that interview lasted four hours. And, you know, to me they were just a young couple. I, I didn't even know what playwrights were. I had no idea how a show goes from infancy to the Broadway stage. I mean, I'm, I wasn't a part of theater or anything, like I am now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, now I know where Green Room is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so they were wonderful. You know, I just talked to them for hours. And then, you know, that was 2011. We went home. I went back to Texas and really never thought much about it after that. And social media was kind of becoming popular, Facebook was becoming a thing, and I started seeing a few things about the show being workshopped and going to a festival, but again, I don't know how any of that works. So um, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And then in the summer of 2015, yes, I got a call from the producers of Come From Away and they said, remember that young couple you did the interview with on the 10th anniversary? And I was like, well, of course, you know. And they said, well, they've written a musical and we'd like to invite you to the world premiere opening in La Jolla, California. And so off we go. And we're now gonna watch the show for the first time. And I really didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how prominent my character was in the show. I didn't know that a song that you're going to hear in a few minutes had been written about uh, my aviation career. It literally chronicles my aviation career in a 4 minute and 19 second song, which is just magnificent. And if you were to read my transcript that I did with the writers, you can literally take paragraphs and it, they're verbatim in the song. So I, I can't even imagine that they wrote it, but it is fabulous. And so that was our first experience seeing the show, and we've seen it a few times since then. One of my favorite stories is when the cast met you, it was after they had already been rehearsing the show for a while, and you started telling them their real life story, and they had to act real surprised, like, oh, really? We didn't know you were the first captain for American <laughs> Airlines. <laughs> this is all new information to us. Uh, so it's been a long journey since La Jolla. You've been all over the world to meet people who have seen the show, talk about the show. What has it been like to see the global reach of Come From Away and, and see it go from, like you're saying, a small workshop production or just an idea that started in Gander with two playwrights to being a show that now has five productions around the world? It has been truly the most amazing journey that we could have ever imagined. After the show was in La Jolla to sold the sellout crowds in every city, it went from La Jolla to Seattle, DC, and then the writers, their ultimate goal was to take the show back to Gander because that's really what the show is about. It is about the people of Gander, and we, we just happen to be sub-characters in the show. It's, it's about the kindness and generosity and everything that they did for us over that five-day stay, so the show went back there for two performances, which was amazing. And they don't even have a theater, so it was played in the hockey ring. And um, then it came to Toronto. 
before it opened on Broadway. And um, gosh, it opened on Broadway March 12, 2017, which was just amazing because I think the writers would tell you when they wrote the show, they hoped that it would play in high school auditoriums. Well, it has uh, gone above and beyond that by all means. And so now the Broadway cast is in their third year um, playing indefinitely. They have a Toronto cast. We went to the opening in the UK in February, March, somewhere around there. And now we're getting ready to go to the opening in Australia in July. So I've been to 12 openings so far, and um, I've seen the show 128 times. <laughs> so to say that we have embraced it as the world has embraced it would be an understatement. Yeah, we were expect to feel as they're leaving the theater? What are they going to experience when they see Come From Away and what is that going to leave them with as they walk out the door? Well, I think that's one of the most amazing things about the show is obviously the show would not exist if 9-11 had not happened. However, we always refer to the show as a 9-12 show because it's really about all the, the wonderful things that happened after the attacks of 9-11. And it's a, the most beautiful display of kindness, generosity, and humanity that you could ever see. And one of my favorite things that I learned about the show is when we first saw it in La Jolla, after the performers do the whole show, it's a 100-minute musical with no intermission, moves very fast, the band comes out onto the stage and, and they all play. And that was originally supposed to be the walkout music, like the people in the audience were supposed to leave the theater. <laughs> they won't leave. <laughs> I mean, they, every single show, they jump to their feet when it's over, and they're clapping. And, and so as a result of them not ever leaving, they had to write that into the show, and it's now actually rehearsed, and it's like five minutes, and the audience literally stays on their feet, clapping, and so enthusiastic because it has brought such, such a bright light to that horrific day. And, and they just do it in such a beautiful way. There are so many funny lines in the show. My husband often says, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm watching a comedy. I mean, it, it is hilarious at times, but the really cool thing is that everything you hear and see in the show actually happened. It's all true. And so many people will say, well, did uh, there's a couple represented in the show who, oh, I don't want to give them away. But people in the audience will ask me, did that really happen? And I'm like, yes, everything, everything you see is true. So we're so insanely proud of the show and it has uh, created a whole new life for me because I get to do things like this all over the country and literally all over the world now. Well, thank you so much, Bev. American Airlines had the prettiest planes, so I applied as a flight engineer. But the World War II pilots, they all complained. They said girls shouldn't be in the cockpit. Hey lady, hey baby, hey! Why don't you grab us a drink? And the flight attendants weren't my friends back then. And they said, are you better than us, do you think? But I kept getting hired and the World War II crew, they retired and the girls all thought 
Great. 